Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rafael. I will show a bit of my research uh, with Brazilian indigenous languages. I did this uh, as a topic for my dissertation while I was doing my master's at uh, uh, the University of Reading. And I'll do an introduction, show the analysis of the, the printed material I found, and provide some guidelines, show some guidelines for people who uh, designing typefaces or publications for these native languages. Okay. My main purpose with this is to create a, a reference for type designers and typographers because there's not much about this in Brazil. Uh, okay, some brief information about the country. is the largest country in Latin, Latin America. It's the fifth uh, largest country in the world, uh, both by area and population. The official language is Portuguese. It's spoken all over the country. Uh, it's the only official language. Uh, you can only issue documents in Portuguese. Uh, there is over 190 million people uh, about something about history. In 1500, the Portuguese arrived in, in, in Brazil. So until the 19th century, uh, it's, this is the colonial period. And then in 1808, uh, the Portuguese court uh, escapes from Portugal because of the Napoleon Bonaparte's invasion. So this is an important, this is the start of the imperial period. And this, uh, there's something important about this. It's when the printing press is introduced in Brazil. Before that was forbidden to print because the Portuguese government want, wanted to protect the colony from the British, the Dutch, the French. Uh, so they want to keep the business in secret. So you couldn't print in, in Brazil at that time. So when they came, uh, when they went to Brazil, they took with them British presses and some cases of type. And this is when. So we have 300 years of history without any document printed in the country. Uh, everything was printed in Europe until uh, then. There is something interesting, uh, because in Spanish America, uh, printing started much earlier. Uh, uh, I have a, there is a reference that the first book printed in America was in the 16th century in Mexico. And it's, by the way, a bilingual book in Spanish and uh, native language. So nowadays <coughs> we are a republic and since the uh, late 19th century. Okay. About this indigenous populations, they are traditionally nomadic societies. They live in collective lands delimited by the government. Uh, they are very primitive societies. Uh, so they live in, in the forest, in the woods, in non-urban areas. Uh, there are some statistics about this population. There, uh, there are around 20, uh, sorry, 220 different indigenous groups in the, in the country, uh, which is around 800,000 people. Although millions of people in the country have indigenous ancestry. Uh, I might have indigenous ancestry myself. I don't know, because this is since ever they would. Uh, and before the Europeans, there were more than 1,000 different groups. This is like an estimation. But, uh, and about their languages. Now, the Portuguese is the official, but not the only spoken language in Brazil. There are more than 180 languages. 
they are all unwritten languages and there is good good enough documentation about this like grammars dictionaries since the Jesuits uh, that came with the Portuguese in the uh, 16th century they they started studying these languages and also in the south where Argentina Paraguay Uruguay is there were uh, missions where they studied the languages they in the south they printed books in the 18th century so there is uh, good linguistic documentation while there's almost anything about the, the topography of these languages. This is the distribution, uh, uh, the uh, geographic distribution of the, f the, the, of the families of languages. There are around 45 different families of languages. As you can see, they are mostly in the northwest, this part here is the Amazon. This is where the, the colonizer didn't reach easily in the first four centuries of the, the country. So you can see in the coastline where the colonization started, they, uh, they all died. There are no more indigenous populations in, in the coast. Okay, so I started looking at references. The only uh, academic article about this was written by a student, a next student of mine, uh, Colin Tai, uh, and she bring to light some interesting uh, facts about these languages, about the typography of these languages. And there is an important researcher as well uh, in the same university where I work, he, he has been publishing uh, scientific documentation about these languages since the 1960s. So this is what Kolontai, this student, found uh, problems with diacritics. Because these things uh, uh, are not, some, some things are not in Unicode, some things uh, are, uh, how can I say? You can't input this with a Brazilian keyboard, so people don't know how to do it, some things like this as well. So I started making an analysis uh, based on the material I found, the printed material, mostly educational books. Uh, to see the typographic attributes, the orthographies, the technical conditions that these things were created, the, and the problems related to typesetting. My goal was to analyze as many languages as possible. I will show some examples of publication. This is a bilingual one in Trumai, one language, and Portuguese. They are not really well designed. <coughs> great majority of them. Uh, this is like a health book of Kayabi and other uh, people, this is another uh, primer. Some of them have interesting illustrations, uh, but not really uh, well designed, most of them. Okay, the first thing I was looking was for the character sets, the, the glyph coverage needed for uh, these languages. Some of them use the same character set for the Portuguese. So with the Brazilian Portuguese keyboard, you can uh, typeset these languages easily. But some of them, for example, E tilde or this U bar on the bottom, you don't you don't have this on in the Brazilian keyboard, so it's a bit more difficult. Uh, and then uh, also on the on the bottom, you find uh, examples of things that are not in Unicode, like this uh, U with a bar and a tilde. So this is difficult to typeset. So. These are some examples of things that are not uh, 
pre-composed cartels of Unicode uh, that that are found in these Brazilian languages. So how do you input this? You need combining marks, which is uh, you can attach uh, an accent to a base letter using these anchors, <coughs> this red attachment point. But you need a proper keyboard for this. Like uh, there is one uh, Brazilian uh, indigenous languages keyboard de developed by SIL, for example. So, where this came from? Mostly from the use of the typewriter, because with with a mechanical typewriter you can do everything. You can type an accent over any letter, or you can use. Uh, a hyphen or a comma as a diacritic. So this is what linguists that were working with uh, uh, with educational material and linguistic transcription, this is what they did. So when it became digital, uh, it was too late to come back and uh, do something else. This is an example of a Brazilian keyboard uh, in an Olivetti typewriter, uh, there, were, there was the use of make, uh, electric typewriters as well. And for example, this uh, was typeset with one of these IBM electric uh, typewriters with glyphs that were not in uh, was were not a standard. So this is what. Uh, they did. They <coughs> took a golf ball of this IBM Electric, filed off the characters that didn't need, and changed for uh, the ones that they needed. It's impressive. So it comes from an article of Visible Language. So the problems related to the use of diacritics. These letters that are not in Unicode, stacked diacritics, some spacing, spacing and kerning issues and overlapping characters. For example, uh, this thing of manual placement, it's very common, I think is the most common thing. Uh, you can see many examples of it. This, I tried to identify what is this character, I couldn't, it's like a hook, I don't know what it is. Uh, you see two different tildes, one bit. The spacing in this, the use of the strike through and the spacing is really strange in this sample. Yeah, the, the, the strike through uh, also uh, it's become really strange. The, the underlying feature instead of a macro under the character, uh, different characters from a different font. And this apparently is right, but the spacing is messed up, I don't know why. And funny things happen, uh, many, many examples. This, especially with the I tilde, is problematic because it's too wide and normally it clashes. And this apostrophe, which is, represents a glottal stop, uh, it can clash with the other characters as well. So I try to um, provide guidelines for the design of uh, typefaces for this language and also typesetting related with the character set that they had they should have precomposed glyphs because you can control better the position of the glyphs on top of letters on top of or bottom of letters, but also combining marks that you can combine you can put an accent on top of any letter. Uh, with the use of open type features, you can uh, do like contextual alternates. Then you can access these precomposed glyphs, uh, also localized forms. I will show this in the next examples. And with the mark to base and mark to mark features, uh, you can. It's the way to use the combining marks. Uh, for example, these are examples of precomposed glyphs in a font. 
and uh, these are generated by uh, combining marks. You see on top is Gentium by Victor Gautnik, on, on the bottom is uh, Cambria. The difference is uh, Gentium is, is built to work with any uh, combination, even combinations that don't exist. And there is no problem with Cambria. Is is just not built to work like this. Gentium was built to work like if a cat walks over the keyboard, any combination works. <laughs> so uh, the problem is not the font. Uh, just to make clear. Uh, another thing, it's it's important to have three sets of diacritics: uh, a wider for normal letters and a, a narrower for the I, like and also one for the uppercase. This is what I was calling, uh, uh, talking about the localized forms. Uh, because in Guarani, which is a language, an official language of Paraguay, but is also spoken in many parts of Brazil, they have a consonantal Y and a vocalic Y. So they, uh, Pablo Cosgaia, uh, which is a professor at the University of Buenos Aires, he's using, they are, developing fonts with support for Guarani and they are doing this kind of things using localized forms. Uh, also another issue is the the apostrophe, the glottal stop. Some people like Juan Heilborn is from from Paraguay. He thinks that it's better to design the the glottal stop with uh, with a different shape and bigger than the normal apostrophe. Uh, Cosgaia thinks that the shape should be equal, but deeper than, uh, than a normal apostrophe. So these are the basic guidelines for uh, that I compiled for people who are designing typefaces for these minority languages and there is uh, well if you're interested in reading the dissertation and reading the, the research how I can make this available uh, just drop me an email and I would like to say thank you thank you I think we maybe have uh, time for one really quick question Fine. Yes. Um, and what about designing new glyphs instead of um, building characters with combinations? Designing new glyphs. I mean, you you mean uh, new forms to give that sound, those sounds. Yeah, this is not really recommended by the Unicode Consortium. I think it's it would be a problem. Uh, of implementation, so the guidelines I try to follow Unicode's recommendations. So, in the past, uh, with metal type missionaries and other people did this, but it's proved that it's uh, problematic. So, I avoid to even to recommend this because it doesn't make much sense. It uses the Latin script. They don't have. Uh, written tradition, it's all oral tradition, so I don't, I think uh, Unicode's recommendations make sense for this. Okay. Thank you.